Right, it looks like we may have some problems with uh, Blackboard Collaborate until we get going in, on into the semester. Uh, it's going to be within the course now. It's going to be a lot easier to operate, thank goodness. But uh, until just to make sure this week I'm going to go ahead and record uh, part two instead of doing a live just to make sure that you do have the information in case something goes wrong. All right, so we'll get started with uh, part two. This is going to be our uh, last part of diabetes. I will pull up the PowerPoint, which I had pulled up. Of course, it went bad. All right, so this is part two, and I have posted it with and without notes, so you'll have uh, both of those when we get ready to do the lecture. Uh, looking at uh, part two diabetes, uh, there's a lot going on. It has came a long, long ways from what it used to be. And research actually supports that really to keep you from getting those macro and micro complications that I talked about in part three, that if you keep your blood sugars within normal limits for a diabetic, that's keeping that, he that hemoglobin A1C below 7%, keeping your cholesterol levels controlled, then those micro and macro complications can actually be prevented. So let's go over etiology again. Let's look at type 1 versus type 2. Now, type 1 changed its name in 1997 from insulin-dependent diabetes to type 1. And it also, at that time, was called juvenile onset. And the reason it has changed is why? Because now we have some type 2 that are insulin-dependent. So we can't just say insulin-dependent, non-insulin-dependent. So type 1 diabetics and type 2 is the new terminology. Now, there is a destruction of beta cells with type 1. Something happens to the body. They believe an autoimmune destruction occurs of the beta cells. Well, if an autoimmune uh, destruction occurs of the beta cells in the pancreas, then insulin production will cease to exist. Now, people do not inherit type 1 diabetes. Rather, they inherit a genetic predisposition or tendency because they have certain HLAs on specific chromosomes particularly HLA DR3, DR4, and DQ. Now, HLA DR2 protects against uh, diabetes uh, type 1. So if you've got more 2, you're in good shape. If you've got more of the 3, 4, and DQ, then you're more likely in the presence of an autoimmune disorder, certain autoimmune, particularly viruses, then you are more than likely uh, to develop type 1 diabetes. Now, with this, when I say viral destruction, I'm talking about things like cytomegalovirus, CMV, uh, Epstein-Barr, mumps, and hepatitis particularly. Now, this occurs more frequently in uh, white Americans. And we were going back to these markers here. And if you have just one of these markers, let's say you have DR3, and you're a child and you come into contact with mumps, for example, then you have a two to three times risk of any other child of getting diabetes, of it actually turning against your pancreas and destroying those islet cells. If you have two or more markers, let's say you've got DR3 and DR4s, then you have a seven to ten times more risk of getting um, diabetes. Um, so you can tell that the risk factor goes up, and if you have all three, then the risk factor uh, even increases increases more significantly. Now with type 2 diabetes, the new terminology is da, 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 diabetes plus obesity equals diabetes. So this is the number one risk factor for type 2 is obesity. Okay. So type 2, formerly called non-insulin dependent, we can't do that anymore, so in 1997 it got a name change as well to just type 2. And that was because now we have type 2 diabetics who are insulin dependent. Of the two types of diabetes, we know that type 2 accounts for the majority. In fact, 90% have type 2, so that just leaves 10% with type 1. There is a strong genetic component. There's no HLA relationships, but it is genetically passed down. Again, the number one risk factor is obesity. Those who are increased risk are your Native Americans, your African Americans, your Hispanics as compared to your Caucasians. Now obesity uh, decreases the insulin receptors in your tissues 
and that's what leads to what we know as insulin resistance. In other words, there's no supply for the high demand. There's no place to take it up and store it, okay? So, why is diabetes occurring more frequently? Well, we have a longer life expectancy. So we know that type 2 mainly occurs in, we said, early peaks in the 50s. Well, therefore, we're going to see it more. Obesity, in fact, across this uh, age span is increasing. And sedentary lifestyles. And we're in this food craze, all-you-can-eat bars. Okay, that means fill up your plates three or four times, right? Now, there is an interaction between genes and the environment. If you think about it this way, genes load the gun and your environment might pull the trigger. So in other words, you may be set up for type 2 diabetes. You may have the loaded guns. But they're not going to go off unless you do things in your lifestyle that sets them off like become obese, right? If you diet, you exercise, even if you've got genetic tendency, you can keep from getting type 2 diabetes. If you don't, if you set up your lifestyle to coincide with the risk factors with diabetes, then more than likely you're going to pull the trigger. So, who should be screened? Well, all individuals uh, who have a BMI, who, who, oh, excuse me, all individuals who's greater than 45 years of age, especially if your BMI is greater than 25. Well, that would be the majority of the population. And what are they going to test you with? A fasting plasma glucose. Okay, they're going to check your sugar on a fasting in the morning. Children who are overweight, BMI greater than the 85th percentile, and have other risk factors like family members who have type 2, or they're at a race who's at high risk, or they have other conditions associated with insulin resistance. If their mother had gestational diabetes, then they need to start at age 10 with a fasting plasma glucose. Okay, so these are our screening guides to diabetes. Screening, screening, should have thought secondary, automatically level of prevention. All right, so let's talk about some apples and let's talk about some pear shape. When you talk about abdominal fat, you talk about two structures mainly. And this is more of our apple shape where we're rounded. Our pear shape is where we come down and then we've got a whole lot going on in the hip area, right? So, with the apples, they tend to have more abdominal fat. Here we have more gluteal and femoral fat, right? It's all in the trunk. Well, which one of these do we know has more increased risk of heart disease and therefore can lead to diabetes? Well, it's going to be your apples, your abdominal uh, fat shaped people. So who's more at risk, the pears or the apples? Of course, it would be the apples. Um, and it's harder for them to lose weight. If you're an apple, you know that. Um, so just keep that in mind. The shape of the body actually has an impact as well. Well, what about scats versus vats? What in the world are you talking about, Miss Candler? Well, SCAT stands for subcutaneous adipose tissue. And this is fat located immediately beneath the skin. Okay? Then you got VAT. That's visceral adipose, adipose tissue. And this is fat located in the body cavity beneath the abdominal muscle. Now, if you think about it, most of your pear shapes are SCATs. Most of your apples are VATs. Okay, and I like to call the scats the jelly bellies. You can kind of pick that up and just rub it and it just jelly bellies, right? Your vats are more like those that you can bounce a quarter off these people's bellies. You've seen them that's got the rounded abdomen that you go to touch and it's hard as a rock. That's a vat, okay? Now, can you have combos? Can you have a scat vat? Sure, you can have someone who's kind of in between, okay, that's got a little bit of both. Now, the risk factors for diabetes is really strongly related to what we call the metabolic syndrome. And the metabolic syndrome is not a disease. What this is is a collection, you'll see, of health problems that set you up for diabetes. And you do need to know all about these. Um, if you, uh, let's see if I can find it in your book here. When you look at your book on the metabolic syndrome, it talks about it, and it's going to be called uh, Syndrome X, okay? And what they're talking about when they talk about this, and I believe it was somewhere they talked about this in chapter 64, 
And I believe it was around page 308 or somewhere in there that it talked about um, metabolic syndrome or syndrome X. But what I'm facing to tell you is what you need to know for test purposes. You have abdominal obesity. That's your big thing. And this is where the waist circumference is 40 inches or more for men, 40 inches or more for men, and 35 inches or more for women, and 35 inches or more for women and 35 inches or more for women. Then you have your next thing here and you have your triglycerides. With the triglyceride levels, your levels are going to be greater than 150 milligrams per deciliter. They will be greater than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Normal is less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. And your high density cholesterol, HDL, will be less than 40 in men and less than 50 in women. Less than 40 in men and less than 50 in women. And that's not what it should be. It should be the uh, going the other route. Your that, that includes your triglycerides and your HDL. The next thing is hypertension. If you have someone who has a blood pressure that's staying consistently greater than 130 on the top and greater than 85 on the bottom or they are on drug therapy for hypertension, then they would be considered a positive risk factor. If their blood pressure is staying greater than 130 over 85 or more, and they are on drug therapy for hypertension. And the last thing is fa uh, fasting blood glucose level, uh, and it will be elevated. And your book, I believe, uses the cutoff of 100 or more on a fasting. 100 or more on a fasting. Okay. So what is the diagnostic uh, criteria for diabetes? Well, you're going to have a, and this talks about this in your book, on, I just seen that, on page 1308, page 1308. It talks about uh, fasting plasma uh, glucose level at any time greater than uh, 126 milligrams per deciliter, and that's if they're fasting for greater than eight hours, and it has to be more than one occasion. A random, a random blood glucose level greater than 200. A random, that means any time of the day, it would be greater than 200. Then an oral glucose tolerance test, which, is, which would be greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter in a two-hour sample. What they do is go in and give you a 75-gram dose load. Either they can do that injectable or they can do it through a meal and you will go back over the next two hours and keep having your blood glucose level drawn and you will see if it's going down. By two hours your postperennial blood sugar should be less than 200. If after two hours it's still greater than 200 then your oral glucose tolerance test would be considered positive. Hemoglobin A1c 6.5 or higher that was 7 and they moved it down to 6.5 recently um, and that has to be performed in a laboratory using uh, their standardized methods. And that we also have these people who are called impaired glucose tolerance folks, IGTs. They used to be called our borderliners, our pre-diabetics. Now most people who work in diabetes will either say you got diabetes or you don't have it. There's no such critter as pre-diabetes. But your literature right now says there's pre-diabetics. So if fasting plasma glucose is 100 or less is normal, then anywhere between 101 and 126 would be a borderliner or a pre-diabetic or an impaired glucose tolerance person because why? Greater than 126 is actually a diagnostic criteria for diabetes. A two hour greater than 140, so it should be less than 140 in two hours. That's your normal. But if it's greater than 140 but less than 200, remember it had to be over 200 in two hours, then you're considered a borderliner. If your hemoglobin A1C is between 5.5 and 6.5, you're considered a borderliner. Even though 4 to 6 is normal. Why? They're focusing on prevention. So these are the diagnostic criteria for a diabetic and the diagnostic criteria for someone who has prediabetes. Okay. Uh, glycolated hemoglobin or hemoglobin A1C. This is the big tattletale, is what I like to call it. Now, if you were like my grandmother years ago, you used to enjoy going to the doctor because what you would do if you knew you had an appointment is a few, in a few days is straighten up. You would take you a good dose of insulin before you went. You'd make sure you was eating right two or three days before you went. You'd get that sugar real good 
so that when you went in and they did your fasting plasma glucose level, it would be pretty good. Now, hemoglobin A1C come along and it tattletailed on my poor grandmother and she did not like it, bless her heart. But the hemoglobin 1AC is a protein in the red blood cells that carries oxygen to tissues. And since red blood cells live about 120 days, a hemoglobin A1C actually measures your diabetic's control for the previous three months. So in other words, they could come in with a fasting glucose level that is, let's say, 130. Well, that's pretty good for a diabetic. But if their hemoglobin A1C comes back and it's 10, you know that they've probably been uh, extremely high as their norms. Normal results are 4 to 6 in a non-diabetic person, in a diabetic person greater than 6.5. And our goal is to always keep the hemoglobin A1C in diabetics less than 7%. Levels higher than that actually indicate poor compliance. Now, anemia can falsely uh, cause low levels because someone who's anemic uh, will have low levels. Blood transfusions also affect the results if you're getting someone else's blood. Uh, you want to monitor this about three to four times a year, the hemoglobin A1C. And they do have an in-home version, but again, for, and it is considered pretty reliable. It has actually been approved by FDA that you can get over the counter, and it takes about eight minutes to appear with the results. But most of the physicians are going to want to draw their own. So what is a hemoglobin? How does that compare to a blood sugar reading? Well, if you have someone who comes in with, let's say, I said earlier, 10. Let's say their hemoglobin had been A1C come back and it was 10%. Look what they've been averaging, 240. So even though they came in that morning and their fasting was 130, they're controlled for that day. But overall, it shows that they have been uncontrolled. So you can see here we said we wanted diabetics less than 7%. Well, even at 7%, they've been averaging 154, which is really a little high. So that's why they want them in between here. In between 6 and 7.5, you're going to be in, what, about the one third, upper 130s as an average. So this is just so that you kind of know the difference between hemoglobin A1C and your blood sugar levels. The higher this goes, the higher your uh, blood sugar average reading goes. All right, so what's new in blood glucose readings? Well, they're simpler to use. They almost look like a walking um, telephone years ago. They provide results quicker. They're easier to collect blood samples. Uh, they're more portable. They've got a lot more memory. They require a smaller blood drop in data. And in the future, they're actually trying to come up with blood glucose monitors that measure non-invasively. Kind of like start inserting your finger into the pulse oximetries today. They're trying to come up with meters that do that to decrease the number of sticks that diabetics have to have. But so far, no luck. Clinical manifestations for a type 1. Well, they're going to have your three Ps that come on abruptly. Your polydipsia, polyuria, and polyphagia. Fatigue and weight loss is going to go along with that. Now, what's the rationale for the three Ps? Well, for the polyurea, it's because of osmotic diuresis. The amount of glucose filtered by the kidneys exceeds what's being absorbed. Then you get uh, the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid becoming more concentrated. We know things go from a lesser concentration to a greater. We start pulling that out, and then we start diuresing. Once we do that, then we're going to make those cells storage depleted. And when we do that, they're going to starve, particularly for carbs. Okay, that's going to re lead to cellular starvation, increase hunger. The high blood sugar levels, uh, again, increase osmotic diuresis, which leads to intracellular dehydration and stimulates your thirst center. So that's what brings on your three Ps, primarily the osmotic diuresis that's caused from the os uh, increased osmolarity of the blood. Weight loss because of the diuresis and the loss of body tissue. Protein and fat breakdown is secondary to a lack of insulin. If I don't have insulin on board, it's not taking glucose into the cells to be stored. Then that those cells have to have something to uh, survive on. They prefer carbs, but if they can't have carbs, then they will turn to your proteins and your fats. Well, fat breakdown, the problem with that is you increase the uh, number of ketones. Because once fats break down, one of some of the metabolites are known as ketones. And what are ketones? Acids. And that's the byproducts of fat to break down. Now, ketone bodies disturb the acid-base balance. Because we know once we get more acids, 
we've caused an acid-base imbalance. And that leads to metabolic acidosis and DKA. This is for type 1. When fat is used as our primary source of energy, it's never a good thing because lipid levels are going to increase, and once they increase, they can go up to five times their normal level, then that's going to put you at risk for cardiovascular complications. Now, in contrast with type 2, there is sufficient insulin to inhibit the development of DKA. So you won't get what's called DKA with type 2, only in rare, rare conditions. But with type 2, you'll get what's called HHNK, hyperglycemic, hyperosmolic, non-ketoic, so you don't have the ketoic syndrome, syndrome because you've got some insulin on board here. With type 1, you had no insulin. Uh, reoccurring infections, delayed healing, genital itching, because we know hyperglycemia favors fungal growth, candidal infections, visual changes, blurred vision, paresthesis, neuropathies, fatigue, metabolic changes, obesity, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and again, this usually occurs in those uh, particularly over 30 and peaks in your 50s. Now, something to keep in mind with type 2 diabetics is one of the red flags in adolescence. If you have an adolescent, let's say you're working at a clinic, and they, they just keep coming in with vaginal infection, vaginal infection, UTI, UTI, that's a red flag that you might want to check them for type 2 diabetes. And some studies have showed that type 2 diabetes actually occurs about seven years before it's diagnosed. So it comes on very suddenly, okay, especially as you continue to increase your weight gain uh, during that time. Now, there are other forms of diabetes. We're not going to talk about those in this lecture, but there's pancreatic diabetes. If something happens to the pancreas and it's injured, of course, it's not going to, it may affect the beta cells. Drug and chemical induced beta cell destruction. You can have genetic syndromes such as Turner's and gestational diabetes. And there is something known as uh, cystic fibrosis diabetes as well. So we'll talk about some of those later on, but for this lecture, type 1 and type 2 is what we're focusing on. So treatment for type 1. Well, insulin replacement's a must, right? you got to have it. So is there an average dose? Is there a dose that you give almost everybody that you start out with? And no. It varies from one individual to the next. Just like one person can tolerate a 50 and another person can't tolerate a 50 blood sugar, every person has to be treated on an individual basis. There is no cure for diabetes, but the overall goal is to regulate and control sugars, especially with type 1. That's all you can help hope for is the best is to keep their sugars controlled. Now, insulin in the exogenous form has only been used since 1922. And human insulin is the insulin of choice now. Back when I used to give it, we used to use pig insulin uh, and beef extract insulin, beef. But now we use the human, human, humulin insulins. The strengths are U30, U40, U50, U80, U100, and U500. U100 is almost always used in the United States. What's that mean? That means for each meal, each, each uh, syringe that contains one meal, that will give you 100 units of insulin when you pull it up, okay? So use the correct syringe. Use the correct syringe. Insulin is broken down by gastric enzymes. That's why we cannot give it orally. For test purposes, I know these amounts differ slightly from what's in your book, but go by this table uh, for exam purposes. Hint, 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 okay? previous. And I apologize, uh, I don't think that is the right page number down there. Matter of fact, I know it's not. Let me get you the right page number here. Uh, it varies uh, from page 1314 in your book, page 1314. Um, but do not go by that page in 1314 in your book. For test purposes, I want you to know this chart here. For test purposes, know this chart. So let's go over this chart. We've got the rapid acting, the short acting, the intermediate acting, and the long acting. With the rapid acting, that would be your logs, your nova logs, your huma logs. These are clear when you look at them in color, clear. So you need to know about the onsets and the peaks. I'm not going to ask you as much about the durations, even though you do need to know about the durations, but the onsets and the peaks. 
So these are called our dose and eats. Dose and eats. Why? Because once you give the dose, you better eat because when's the onset? Five to 15 minutes. So once you give it, it's going to kick in pretty quick. So these are our dose and eats. Peak, 30 to 90 minutes. And duration, three to four hours. So if you give someone this and then the trays are late, you better have something for them to eat. Okay. The short actings are your humulin R, your nobulin R's. These are your R's. The onset's at 30 minutes. So usually you give these 30 minutes prior to eating breakfast. You'll give these 30 minutes prior to eating breakfast. You, once you give it, you always want to go back and make sure they got their, their di uh, breakfast tray. It's going to peak in 2 to 4, and duration is going to last 3 to 6 hours. Intermediate acting is your MPH, your nobulin N, your humulin N. These are your N's. The onset is 1.5 to 2 hours. It's going to take a little bit longer to kick in. And it's going to peak at 6 to 12 hours. How long is it going to last? Up to about 16 hours. Your long acting, your ultra lentil, and your lantus, or also your levomere, um, onset's about 2 to 6 hours. There is no peak. Once you give it, it's, it continues on for about a 24 hour uh, period plus. So you want to make sure once you give those that if you're giving it to someone who is taking their medicine good and eating. One of the things about the long acting is you do not mix them with anything. Do not mix them with anything. Another thing that's kind of uh, scary is these are clear, these are clear, these are cloudy in uh, appearance, and these are clear. These are your long, long acting. So people used to be able to go from cloudy to clear. Well, now we've got other types that are out there. Um, so with the Lantus coming on board being the ultra long lasting and being clear in color, you want to make sure you are not getting these mixed up. And again, you cannot mix them with other insulins. One of the things you want to be careful about um, is um, making sure that you know that, um, well, I had it on the tip of my tongue. What was I going to say? Oh, when you go to give an, an insulin injection and you want someone to verify it with you, make sure or you're verifying an insulin someone has drawn up that you just don't let them show you the insulin syringe and say, here, I have 10 units of uh, Novolog in here. Why? How do you know that's not Humulin R? How do you know that's not Lantus if you did not see the actual bottle that it came from? Okay, scenario two, they walk up to you with the bottle of Novolog and they walk up to you with a syringe and say, here's what I drew up and here's the app. That's still not good enough. Why? How do you know they didn't pick up the wrong bottle when they handed it to you, when they are handed it to you to see? You want to see it in the bottle that they're drawing from and, that's, uh, and watch them actually draw it up to actually verify it. That's the correct way. So how would I ask a question? Um, I'll, ask, I'll tell you here in just a minute. These are some of your newer insulins too. Uh, Trujo, Trujo and uh, Trabisba. These are markers of Lantus. This is a uh, smaller injection volume. Uh, so you get a more gradual release of insulin. Usually you take this once a day. It has a 24 hour duration. But look here. It's 300 units per meal. Remember I said in the United States we almost use the what? 100 units per meal. So this one is a lot more dangerous and you have to be very careful. It can be used with type 1 and type 2 and I want you to go and watch the YouTube link. This one comes in 200 units per meal used for type 1 and type uh, 2 once daily, 24 hours. Again, watch the link. These are some, again, like I said, your newer insulins. So an example question I might ask you is like the RN is teaching a 15-year-old client about the different types of insulin. The client takes MPH insulin at 8 a.m. The RN interprets that the adolescent understands this type of insulin when the child states that the most likely time for an insulin reaction would be while working out at 9, while taking a test at 10, while eating lunch at noon, while golfing after school at 3. So I'm asking you first about MPH. So if you look at your handy dandy chart, that is an intermediate acting. And they're wanting to know when the child is most likely to have a reaction. In other words, when is it going to peak? If you look back over here, MPH peaks in 6 to 12 hours. And they are getting it at 8 o'clock. So the more likely time would be when? While golfing after school at 3 p.m. The answer is D. 
There's combination insulins out there, Humulin 7030. That means it's got 70% MPH and 30% regular. There's the Humulog 7525, where the Humulog is 25% and the insulin uh, Lispro uh, MPL, uh, which is very similar to MPH. Okay. The only kind of insulin given IV is your short-acting regulars. Short-acting regulars. I have seen Humalog a few times, but the main one is short-acting regulars. The proper way to verify, I just went over that with you. Some fast facts about insulin. Insulin in use may be at room temperature for up to four weeks. Uh, all the other insulin should be refrigerated. If mixing regular with uh, lentil or ultra lentil, give the injection immediately. Again, uh, the ultra lentil you can, Lantus is the one that cannot be mixed with anything. Lantus cannot be mixed with anything. Ultra lentil can, but give it immediately. No need to aspirate. That's a big thing right now. No need to aspirate anymore. Um, as far as holding pressure after an injection site, you want to do that, but never massage because that uh, affects the metabolism of insulin. Okay. The newest thing out there is sliding scale insulins, low dose, medium dose, and high dose insulins. And the big thing that they are working on uh, insulin. Um, Sliding scales, particularly even in ICUs, uh, they will put insulin drips on people, particularly post-surgery uh, that may not even be diabetics because they have found in the research that if you keep someone's sugar uh, well controlled after surgery, particularly major surgeries, that they heal better and do better. So that is one of the newer things you may see in the ICU units. Uh, the actual uh, insulin... Um, Sliding scales are very easy. You, if someone's on a low dose, you just go by what they are at. You just look down on the sliding scale. You see what your reading was, and it will tell you how much insulin to give them. It's pretty self-explanatory. As far as the mixing of insulins, you want to rotate or roll. Uh, MPH would be an intermediate if you were uh, giving a long-acting and a short-acting or a, a clear and a cloudy one. You always go clear to cloudy, clear to cloudy. So you're going to rotate your MPH or your long acting. You're going to draw back the amount of air in the syringe that equals the total dose. So let's say you're giving 10 of MPH and 10 of regular. Then I'm going to uh, draw back 20, the one that equals the total dose, into the uh, long acting uh, or intermediate. Then I am going to inject air equal to the intermediate or long acting dose into the vial. And then I'm going to inject air equal to the regular insulin dose into that vial and draw the regular insulin up first, which is the clear, and then withdraw the cloudy. Okay. And you put the air in it first so that it helps it come out and it will have all those bubbles. Now, some of the controversies you're going to see is, well, do I go in at a 45 degree angle or a 90 degree angle? And the answer is depends. It depends upon the amount of subcutaneous tissue they have. And for type 1s, most of these are thinner. It goes by their age, their size. So if it's a very emancipated thin person, 45 degrees is going to get it. If it is a heavier set type 2 diabetic who's on insulin, then 90 degrees is going to be called for. So you have to use your judgment. Use of alcohol pads. Well, they are saying now research supports that soap and water is just as good if you let it dry than using alcohol pads. What about the use of the same syringe? Research supports that insulin preparations have bacterial static additives that actually inhibit the growth of bacteria that's commonly found on your skin. But is it a good thing to do? Well, you want to disregard it if it becomes dull, bent, or contaminated. Well, how do you know when it becomes dull, bent, or contaminated? If you look on page 1317 in your book, it shows you uh, the reuse of an insulin syringe, and they put this under a microscope and blown it up so that you can see. A is a new syringe. You can see it has a nice fine point. B is a needle that was used once. You can see at the end it's already bent. C is a needle that has been used twice, and D is one that has been used six times. Now, I don't know about you, but a diabetic does not need that kind of tear, and no wonder it hurts more as you use the same syringe. But so most of the people say that, no, it is better not to use the same syringe. But you will find diabetics that want to use their syringe over and over. What about disposals of the needles? Well, a lot of your communities have come up with programs. There's also www. Um, 
safeneedledisposal.org uh, that gives uh, that will give uh, patients guidelines into what kind of um, containers at home, like coffee uh, containers, uh, that's something with a lid that they can put their needles in and dispose of them. Uh, rotation of sites, uh, it needs to, used to, they would say, rotate all your sites to a different area every time. Now they will say, use one area for four to six injections, then move to another area. Move that, use that area for four to six injections, then move to another area. You want it to be about one inch apart from the area that you used it uh, the prior time. If you're using the, umbilic the uh, abdomen, then you want to be two inches away from the umbilicus or the navel. Peak times are going to be different because of the different locations. So you want to keep that in mind as well. Atrophy or muscle atrophy can occur where you break down, and if you get into all those hard areas, then that eradicates the uh, absorption of your insulin. So what about the absorption sites? Well, the abdomen is the fastest but the shortest duration. The arm is pretty fast but has a shorter duration. The thigh is slow but has a longer duration. And the buttocks is the slowest with the longest duration and actually the least preferred. The most preferred method is the abdomen, the arm, or the thigh. Now think about what you're going to be doing for the day. For example, exercising before you choose your site. If you know you're going to get on a bike and ride that bike um, for miles and miles and miles, you probably don't want to give it in your thigh that day, right? Because exercise is going to increase the rate of absorption and decrease the time of onset of action. No matter what you're going to do, if you give insulin and then you start exercising, you always want to watch for hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia. Uh, insulin pumps are one of the newer things that are out there. Continuous subcutaneous insulin infusions. Who would be a candidate? Well, number one would be anyone who's getting multiple daily injections without results of good hemoglobin A1C. So if they're getting five or six injections a day and their hemoglobin A1C is staying at eight, then they probably need a pump. Most of your uh, children now are getting pumps because they control their sugar better and they do better on them. Uh, some of your newer pumps actually translate information to the pump uh, monitored by a skin sensor that actually will tell them what their glucose reading is as well. So that's pretty cool. And this is on page 1316 in your book. It shows you uh, the mini uh, med paradigm real-time insulin pump and the continuous glucose monitoring system that's set up to it. So pretty cool system. Um, what this does, these came about in the 1970s, and at first the insurance companies weren't on board very well. But they're on board now because they have noticed a decrease in, in long-term complications because it controls the sugar better. Because that little pump, and it hooks on their belt or whatever, it's small in size. It has a 3 mil syringe in it, so if we're using U100, it holds up to about 300 units. It's expensive. It's around four to six thousand, depending upon uh, what model you get. Uh, bolus. Um, it depends upon your carb intake with these. So now the newer things with diabetics is carb counting. Is carb counting, and what they will do is for an adult, your ratio is about one to fifteen. For every fifteen grams of carb, you give one unit of insulin. With children, that ratio is usually 1 to 20. For every 20 grams of carbs, they get a unit of insulin to cover that meal or that snack. So if you were to eat a meal, and you're eating, and the adult's eating a 60 grams of carbs in a meal, how much insulin would they need to bolus themselves with to cover that meal? And the answer is 4 units. And the answer is 4 unit bolus. Okay? Because if you think about it, on the adult, it was 1 to 15. There's 16 grams of carb, 60 grams of carb. So if you divide 15 into 60, you'll get 4. Okay. If it's a 1 to 20 for children, they would get a 3-unit bolus. And again, we talked about the cost. The advantages and disadvantages. This is tight glucose control. Uh, it's very small. It's the advantage. It's flexible. They have some water safe models even. Uh, it eliminates individual insulin injections uh, for the uh, for some folks, uh, for most folks, because it's delivered via the pump. 
It's accurate and it improves your hemoglobin A1C levels. It can be used for all ages. Its disadvantage is that it's expensive. It's subject to malfunction like all machines. It does require the client to be on board to participate. You can get infections. You do have to monitor your blood glucose levels except some of these newer models that actually do that for you. And some of them you can't take off for more than one to two hours. So motivation is the key. Now the pre-filled syringes would be like your Nova pens, your pens. Um, and in Europe, 95% of clients use pens as compared to only 5% in the U.S. Why? And the reason for that is in Europe, if you have diabetes, you go to a diabetic specialist, an endocrinologist. In the U.S., the majority of our diabetics go to general MDs. Uh, they have socialized medicines as well, and they encourage the use of pens. The advantage is the puncture is automatic. It's convenient. It's accurate. It's easy. It doesn't allow for mixing. It's unless you get 70-30. It has a maximum dose of 80 units at one time. The storage is stable, 7 to 30 days once open. And cost reimbursement varies. I'm sorry, I had someone come in and interrupt me. apologize for that. Oops, back. Back one, sorry. Treatment for type 2, on the other hand. So type 1, it had to have insulin replacement, right? You need to know that chart. You need to know particularly the onsets and the uh, peaks of every type of dose. You need to know about the insulin pump. If you've never seen a pump, then you need to Google insulin pumps. It will tell you how to set one up. It will show you what an insulin uh, pump looks like. So please Google those. There's nothing like seeing something. With type 2 diabetics, though, the emphasis is on medical management. Now we're focusing on blood sugar levels, lipids, and blood pressure goals. Therefore, it involves three factors, diet, medication, and exercise. The use of oral hypoglycemic agents meant to supplement diet and exercise, not replace them. It's not like you can eat a huge foot-long Tootsie Roll and take a metformin at the same time and it's covered. It doesn't work that way. I wish it did. Targets with your oral hypoglycemic agents, that's what OHA stands for, oral hypoglycemic agents. You want them to have a fasting between 90 and 130, someone who's on an oral hypoglycemic agent, a postperennial blood sugar, that means two hours after you eat, less than 180, Hemoglobin A1C less than 7. That means they are doing A-OK -okay with their whole oral hypoglycemic agents and are well controlled. Now, diabetes management is monitoring ABCs, and that doesn't stand for airway, breathing, and circulation. That stands for A, hemoglobin A1C, glycemic control, B, blood pressure, and C, cholesterol or lipid levels. Now, your oral hypoglycemic agents are your first generation sulfonylureas. These are your long acting 24 hours. These are your oldest class of drugs and we don't use these much. The reason we don't use these much anymore is because we got a lot of newer drugs out there that have fewer side effects and actually work better. Their action is to increase sensitivity to insulin therefore stimulates the release of insulin from the islet cells. They can cause hypoglycemia so you use them with caution with anyone with liver and kidney problems because they're metabolized and excreted in the liver and kidneys. And some of the common side effects are GI disturbances, rash, nausea, fullness, heartburn. Alcohol intake increases hypoglycemic activity. So you want to watch if someone who is not eating, drinking alcohol, and taking an oral hypoglycemic agent is a, is a potential case for someone going into a diabetic coma. Uh, take with food and usually take at breakfast. One of the things these do cause is weight gain, so people don't like to try to take these. Now, how do I know which oral hypoglycemic works best for which patient? Well, you have to consider what's best for that patient. You look at cost. The physician's going to look at their age. He's going to look at the response, how well they're doing. If they don't do well in another one, he'll try a different one. He's going to look at their history. Do they have kidney and liver problems? Because that may uh, depend upon what med that they're going to try as well. Um, as far as 
uh, looking in your book, it goes over these on um, page 13, 12. Um, but again, I have divided these up uh, for you. So if you know what's on my PowerPoint, you will be okay. So some examples of first generation siphonic areas would be like your uh, oronase, your tolanase, your diabinase, most of your aces. These are long actings. Um, most durations are up to 24 hours, except your diabinase, it's 24 to 72 hours. So what's the implications for me just saying that for you as an RM? If you give someone diabinase and they don't do well and they get sick on you and they have a hypoglycemic reaction, you got to deal with that for the next 72 hours. So this can be a good thing, bad thing. Again, you want to take these with food at breakfast. Your second generation sulfonylureas, you look at the action and the caution. Uh, and it's the same as the first generations. They are more expensive, but they have fewer side effects. They're also not as hard on the kidneys. So we're going to tend to use second generation over first generation sulfonylureas. You will only see very old timers who really are stuck on their first time generation sulfonylurea is still on them. Most have gotten away from the first generations completely. Examples, these are your more G words, long acting, durations 24 hours. And I say G words because they all have the letter G in them. I will be putting for this test purposes both names, generic and trade on there. These you take with food except glucotrol. You take it a half hour before meals. So if I was to say Pick all the following above that uh, has um, second generation so font areas. I'd be looking for what? G words. The uh, biquanidads are the intermediate actings. Uh, these reduce hepatic glucose production and they boost sensitivity in your muscle, fat, and liver. Now they do have a bonus in that they decrease triglyceride levels. They are not metabolized by the liver, they're excreted by the kidneys, and they're glued for clients with significant obesity. Renal insufficiency can lead to lactic acidosis, so that's one thing you always want to monitor, their renal status. Side effects, diarrhea, diarrhea, and when I mean diarrhea, it's like dumping syndrome. When they first take it for about the first two weeks, they need to be warned that they need to be close to a bathroom. After that, it gets better. The main one that we give is metformin or glucophage. Metformin or glucophage. This one is given to almost all diabetics right now, so this is one you need to be familiar with. And the duration is up to 24 hours. It can cause a little upset stomach, diarrhea, uh, and drowsiness. Now, it has no effects on beta cells, and it doesn't increase insulin levels directly. Um, it should be stopped before any surgery or procedure that requires a contrast study. And it should be restarted at least 48 hours thereafter until renal function is confirmed. So if you know someone who's on metformin and they're going in and having a dye contrast, they need to be informed. They need to stop this. And it's best to stop it 48 hours before and 48 hours after uh, the test. Most people with diabetes will start out with 500 to 1,000 milligrams twice a day, with your maximum dose being 2,550, 2,550 milligrams. So this one, again, is a big one. You want to know about this one because this is one of the uh, most common ones you'll see. Your alpha glucosidase inhibitors, your starch blockers, these facilitate insulin's action on peripheral receptor sites and interfere with GI absorption of carbs thereby giving the pancreas time to secrete insulin to moderate to uh, moderate your postperennials. So you got someone having trouble with keeping those postperennials down, this one's a good one to give. If you got someone having trouble, postperennial glucose levels, this is a good one to give. Now they're going to be a do, doing a lot of what I call Putin and tooting. No, it causes flatulence and diarrhea along with some abdominal pain. But this is the best one to give with someone who needs control with the postperennial blood sugars. Examples would be precoce, glycet, uh, and duration can be only up to about eight hours with this one. Your TZDs uh, increase receptor sensitivities to insulin and lipid levels. They are metabolized in the liver, excreted in the feces. That's a little different. They uh, main side effects of your TZDs are like cold-like symptoms, uh, headache, uh, anemia, fluid retention and weight gain, so watch clients with CHF. 
Uh, they can take this with food. Your example will be your Actos, your Embed, and uh, Avandia. And you have to be real careful. Some of these have been taken off the market. Your Regulin was taken off the market because it was shown to uh, cause liver failure uh, and heart attacks uh, in some people. One of the biggest things I can tell you is to be very careful with someone, particularly on either one of these drugs, who has CHF. I have seen someone and it about put them in CHF because they gained so much weight and retained so much fluid that they had to get off of it because of that, simply because it was throwing them into CHF. So someone who's already in CHF cannot hardly tolerate either one of these medications. Keep that in mind. Duration is unknown. They think it's greater than 24 hours. All right. Um, they do have some analogs out there, your Starlex, your uh, printing, that you give 30 minutes before meals. Uh, you have, mainly need to watch for hypoglycemia. You will not see these very often. Some of your other meds, you will see DPP-4 inhibitors. This is like your Genuvia, your uh, Onglisa. These are given once daily along with diet and exercise and help control blood sugar levels with type 2 diabetics. Uh, DTP-4 uh, blockers actually enhance the body's own ability to control blood sugars um, and it's not associated with weight gain, so most people like that. And they are approved to use for monotherapy or in combination with metformin or your TZDs. Most people with diabetes are on metformin and then one other medication. Uh, they can cause Steven Johnson syndrome, which is real rare. If you don't remember what that is, you'll need to look it up. Uh, but one of the big things that they have found with this is it can cause pancreatitis. Can cause pancreatitis. So you want to make sure you're watching someone who's on a DPT-4 for complaints of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, watching their amylase and lipase levels because it can cause pancreatitis. And if all else fails, order combos. You also have your sodium uh, glucose a co-transport 2 inhibitors and this would be like your Invacana and your Farsiga and these work by blocking the reabsorption of glucose by the kidneys so they increase glucose excretion now when you increase, increase glucose excretion what do you do to that environment down there you make it wonderful for Candidas particularly yeast they will get yeast infection yeast infection yeast infection they will get UTIs and a lot of people actually end up getting, even though Invacon and Farsica work wonderful for the hemoglobin A1C, they lose weight, their pressure goes down, they cannot tolerate that vaginal itching uh, related to that increased glucose excretion and they have to get off of it. Blood glucose levels in diabetics who have elevated blood sugar levels, these are excellent drugs. Side effects, vaginal yeast, and that's for both, UTI for both. And it is, and then specific to Invacana, dehydration, kidney failure, DKA, and increase in cholesterol. So you want to be very careful about watching uh, these medications. The overall precautions, regardless of which medication you're giving, is caution with clients with kidney disease, caution with clients with liver problems, it's excreted in the feces, watch for allergies to your sulfas particularly, Alcohol and oral hypoglycemic agents, remember they can cause an abuse-like effect and they can also cause extreme hypoglycemia. Watch for interactions with other drugs, particularly steroids. We know that steroids increase sugars and durations are going to vary depending upon what type you have. So the mnemonic I leave you with is hot and dry, sugar's high, cold and clammy, need some candy. If you have any questions about anything on here, if you will let me know, I'll be glad to answer any questions or concerns you might have. Thank you. Have a great day.